live in a world in which everything is categorized. Stock analysts must categorize novel technologies like Facebook when it first came out so they can determine a company's value. And social media companies have to figure out how to classify the deluge of new and potentially controversial images and videos online. Everything is categorized, but where do these categories come from? And why do we find so much agreement on them across different cultures? To understand how this happens, we devised an experiment in which people were asked to invent new categories for a large number of unfamiliar shapes. People who did this individually or in small groups organized these shapes in very different ways. But when we gave this task to people in large groups in which people could see one another's answers, every group converged on a nearly identical way of categorizing things. Our study shows that the explanation for why people categorize things in the same way across independent cultures is not in the brain, but it comes down to people's social networks. As people suggest ideas within a network, certain ones are reinforced as they are repeated in people's interactions with one another. Eventually, one idea reaches a tipping point and gains enough traction to lead the entire population to consensus. But although this seems to explain why the members of one group would come to agree with one another, wouldn't we expect this process to happen differently in different groups, leading each group to a different set of categories? That's what anthropologists and computational scientists have thought for years, and indeed, that is what happens in small groups. But we found that even though individuals in small groups varied widely in the category systems they came up with, the tipping point dynamics were the same in every large group, leading over a dozen populations to converge on seeing the world in almost exactly the same way. This only happens in large enough networks, but we found that even 50 people was enough to make the same categories emerge in every population. We are now applying these findings to some of the most urgent real-world problems, like the challenge of content moderation on social media. Where is the line between hate speech that should be removed and free speech that should remain? While individuals may disagree, we are studying whether there is wisdom in the crowds that can help to establish widely agreed upon guidelines. Likewise, even expert physicians can unintentionally exhibit various kinds of race and gender bias when diagnosing patients. We are currently using these findings to design collaboration networks among doctors to pioneer network-based strategies for increasing diagnostic accuracy and reducing implicit racial bias. If we can successfully alter people's social experiences to change the way that they organize new information and categorize new data, this work promises to offer new ways of addressing some of the world's most pressing social problems.